It is yet another Saturday, July 13th, 2024. Oh, the year's half over already. Wow. Anyway, as I usually do on my contemplative weekends, I'm sat here with my piping hot cup of dark magic coffee freshly squeezed from the Keurig and getting ready for the day's sessions, whatever that may be. Today I happen to be updating some of my Pro Tools templates because things have changed in the studio, with the recent addition of another synthesizer, the UBXA, and of course the magnificent Yamaha C7 Grand Piano. Midway through the year, and usually at the end of each year, I perform this type of maintenance on my studio software and hardware just to try to make it less of a nightmare and to keep the updates from piling up. So that's what I was doing just now when I thought, hey, this might be a great opportunity to demonstrate how I build entire sessions from scratch using my DAW of choice, Pro Tools, although this could pertain to any DAW, really. I'm pretty sure they all have the exact same basic functionality, like channels and faders, buses, inserts and sends, signal routing via buses, monitoring, oh, and record and playback, <laughs> of course. And the most important thing of all, in my opinion, is offering an efficient workflow. That last item is so important to me, and I think it should be to you too. Who wants to have their creative juices tainted by ridiculously hard to use software or hardware? Even those who have racks upon racks of outboard gear still have an amazingly efficient workflow to keep that from wasting their time. I have almost no outboard gear in my studio, instruments aside. My EQs, my compressors, limiters, and almost every effect I use is in the box a VST, an audio unit, or an AAX in the case of Pro Tools. I do have a couple of pedals that occasionally I set up as sends from a channel, but not very often. Things like routing to Microcosm or the Soma Cosmos, for example. With that brief introduction out of the way, let's get back to my blank session in Pro Tools and build what I call my Songwriter Quickie template from scratch. Starting from a blank session in Pro Tools is not something I do very often. I generally work alone here in my home studio, so I have templates designed for instant startup of a session, saving me tons of time getting an idea on paper, so to speak. But for the purpose of this video, I will build one of my common templates from a blank session into something that is hopefully <laughs> functional, if I remember how. This is my DAW, Pro Tools 24.06, and this is the edit window. And this is what the blank mix window looks like. Pretty blank, huh? I usually start building in mix view, but I'll switch back and forth throughout this process so you can see the session coming together as it may relate to other DAW software like Cubase or FL Studio, etc. While conceptually channels, inserts, sends, and buses are all common across most DAWs, I think the DAW that lays things out completely different might be something like Bitwig, which I'm sorry to say I have not yet had spare time to dive into and learn. This was on the 2024 agenda, but it's f***ing mid-July already and time is running out. Before I begin, I'll warn you this is not a templates or mixing video. This is just how I do signal routing in my sessions to get up and running quickly. There'll be a separate video for DAW templates and how I do mixing and mastering as time permits. Now on to the build. Every session needs master faders, in my humble opinion. Consider this the very end of the signal flow where all the sound leaves the mixer and heads towards your amplifier, headphones, or speakers. My particular setup includes three master faders for desktop monitors, my HS8s, the main PA, which is a crown amplifier, and my headphone mixer, which is an Alesis Multimix. Let's add those right now. Here to the leftmost of my mix, some like to put their master faders to the far right because of the whole left to right flow thingy, but I like my master faders locked to the left so when I'm using a control surface, they are quickly available at my left hand. Note how at least with Pro Tools, the three master faders I just added are automatically routed to the first three inputs of my mixer. In the Pro Tools routing matrix, you can see my first three stereo outputs here are the HS8, the main PA, and the headphones. What this looks like in my mixer software, oddly also called Master Fader, is the three stereo pairs coming out of USBs 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6 are going to these XLR jacks in the front of my hardware mixer, and those XLR cables are going to the desktop monitors, the PA amp, and the headphone mixer. I hope this makes sense. This is something I had to manually set up, of course, unless you have a much simpler setup using only one audio interface with an out one and two to your amplifier or headphones, then none of this hardware mixer setup is necessary. You may notice that my USB five and six here is also paralleled to the mixer's monitor left and right outputs. 
This is because I still need to be able to record this voiceover and I cannot record in the DAW while I'm trying to add and configure channels in the DAW. So I have to record this voiceover to an external device. Enter my lovely Tascam, which is acting as a submixer for OBS recording this session. <laughs> okay, that was a lot of info. Are you still with me? The only thing that's important here is that you have at least one master fader to your main out one and two of your audio interface or mixer. So let's move on. Next up are two more tracks that go into every one of my sessions. The first one being a stereo audio track I call print. And the second being a stereo aux called comp. Now these are my terms for the functionality of these tracks. I cannot promise these terms are correct, but I learned this 20 years ago and old habits are hard to break. First, what is print? Print is, again in my world, the final mixed mastered product. It is the sum of all the parts in a completed form. Usually a stereo wave at 24 bits and no less than 48 kilohertz sample rate. My print file is what goes to mastering or becomes my MP3 or WAV file to listen to on various devices to see if I mix things properly. The industry in 2024 probably has newer names for this stuff since moderns like making up new words for things us oldies were perfectly comfortable with. Now, comping is still a real thing today. It is the process of pulling together multiple takes of a recording to find the best of the best and make one perfect track. Think of it like vocals. Your singer sings a song once and there are a couple of spots that they really nailed, but a couple that were a bit squishy. So you create a playlist or an alternate track and the singer may sing the entire song three or four times over the course of a recording process. Maybe you have them sing one or two specific lines over again. Then you, as the mixing engineer, snip bits of audio together to comp a track and make your masterpiece. A comp channel in my mix is sort of the same thing, although again, probably mislabeled in my terminology. Every sub bus in my mix eventually goes through a single stereo comp channel because this is where I put the final icing on the cake usually. My mastering plugins like a final EQ or a dash of limiting. But my comp channel serves another purpose as well is it's also my signal router to the three master faders we just created. Think of it like this. Do you want to have a send on every one of your channels to three outputs individually? No. You do not even want to send every submix individually to three different outputs. So instead, you send all those submixes to a comp channel, and comp sends to master faders one, two, and three as you see fit. Does that make sense? Now, to get your submixes to go to comp, you need to create a bus. And yes, it is exactly like that image that just flashed in your mind of a big city bus rolling down the road full of people, or in this case, audio signals. A bus is a specific route, and in this case, bus one and two is assigned to the input of the comp channel, and we rename it to comp, so it's clear what, what its route is. When we make our first submix in a moment here, you'll see me set that submix output to comp, which is bus one and two, and maybe this will start making some sense. While I'm here, I want to make another bus for my print routing. When all my submixes are coming into comp, and comp has its final tweaks and is ready to print, I will need to use another stereo bus to route that final signal to print for recording. The print channel input is bus three and four, renamed to print for clarity. You will now start to see every channel in this mix has an input where the signal is coming from and an output to where the signal is going to. The very last thing I do to comp, for now at least, is to take some of that signal and send it to Master Fader 2 and 3. You'll see the default out for comp is the HS8s or Master Fader 1 in my mix. But I want to play this audio signal also to my main PA in the room to annoy my neighbor's dogs. I also want it in my headphone mixer for when I'm doing initial mixing, or if I need to share the mix with musicians in the room via headphones. So to do that, I'll use what's called a send from comp to main PA and headphones, both full power, zero dB. I put a note in here because I forgot earlier and almost blew the top of my head off. Make sure you turn down your external amplifier volumes before you send a signal through, because at least in my case on my desk, my HS8s are so powerful they nearly break my eardrums <laughs> if they're at full power. So just turn down your amplifiers. Your headphones are probably gonna be okay but external amps, turn them all down until you have signal coming through and then raise them to a desired level. That's my best advice to save your ears. 
And finally, for this initial introduction to signal routing, you may notice that there is a difference between outputs and buses on channel outputs and interface buses on channel inputs. For my 32 channel mixer, I have 16 stereo inputs as shown here. Depending on the type of channel you made, stereo or mono, will determine how many channels in and out you can assign. For example, if I convert this print channel to a mono width, using this converter here in Pro Tools, change it to a mono track, you can see now it's just mono. Check out what, what happens to my inputs. So I have all 32 now. Mono inputs are usually things like guitar direct inputs, microphoning guitar amps or bass amps, microphones themselves, like I'm talking into one right now that's a mono channel, not stereo. Changing the width of this channel back to stereo, you can see again the inputs now change back to, uh, to 16 stereo. So I hope that makes sense as well. So the rest of this build should go pretty quick because I'm not going to stop and explain every single routing thing. <laughs> so let's see if we can step this up a bit. Speaking of mono inputs, let's create our lead vocal track and its submix. For this example, I'll stray a little bit away from the template I showed at the beginning, only because I want to demonstrate multiple mono vocal channels summing into a single stereo submix. Wow, say that 10 times fast. So let's, so let's create the channels now. I'm going to insert three mono audio tracks here. I'm going to call them vocals. And then I'm going to create a stereo auxiliary channel called Vox Sub. You may be asking if vocal tracks are mono, why are you creating a stereo aux as a sub? And that's a great question. I suppose you could make a mono sub, but here's why I do not want to do that. See how all three of these vocal tracks are pan dead center? That will sound awfully dull in the mix, right? So we want to pan vocal two a little bit to the left and vocal three a little bit to the right. And the only way to experience that stereo panning is, ta-da, through a stereo mix of the vocals. So let's fly through these buses and sub setups real quick. All three vocal tracks out need a new bus, which I will rename to Sub Vox, again for clarity. Then for our stereo aux, we will assign that bus as its input so that all three vocals end up here. And finally, the Vox sub out goes to comp, because this is where all the audio signals end up in my mix. Since these are our first performer tracks in this session, it's a good time to talk about how I personally like setting up my tracks. Clearly, you can see I enjoy color. Pretty sure all DAWs today allow some form of color coding of their tracks and channels, but if they don't, they might look something like this. All gray and boring. So speaking of color, I have a scheme that matches my Mackie mixer usually, and Vox tracks are bright red. Not the same red as Master Fader, of course. If we look back at the Mackie mixer real quick, way off here to the right is the sub mixes in the Mackie. So they are this nice little blue color here. So for the sub, for all the subs in my mix, I like using a nice color blue. The last thing to note is the inputs automatically default to one, two, and three from my audio interface because that's just how Pro Tools works. I feel most DAWs probably do that as well, but this is where you can change that to what inputs your microphones really are attached to. Again, I have a 32 channel mixer and depending on the audio interface, you may only have one or one, two stereo input, etc. So your mileage may vary. This is completely reliant on your hardware interface. Next up are some of my favorite toys in the studio, the virtual instruments. Again, this is also very subjective because if you do not use V-Insts, you do not need these. I do. And because I record alone most of the time, I need a full band added to my session. So here's how that might look. I'm going to create six stereo instrument tracks. And because I know how this is going to be laid out, I'm going to add three stereo auxiliary tracks as my subs. How I set up my band is first the bass guitar, followed by an acoustic guitar one and two, and an electric guitar one and two, and finally a V piano, which is usually where I start my creative process. I also like to color code these as well. The bass guitar can stay the default color. The guitars are usually a yellow color. The virtual piano is hot pink, so it can stand out in the mix. 
I may also add more virtual synths to the mix as I go, so this is why I made three more stereo auxes for submixes. One for the bass guitar, because I may add another low-end bass sound to the mix, and I want to sum that up. I'll route all the guitars to the guitar sub, and finally the synth keys to a V-inst sub. And of course their sub coloring. Now for busing, I'll get a little fancy here and use some of Pro Tools specific hotkeys to assign sub input buses by multi-selecting the three subs here and choosing the next three in the list, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You can see how they automatically assign in sequence. And then I'm going to rename them accordingly. This is going to be sub bass. This one will be sub guitars. Is it plural? No. Sub V inst. With those buses assigned, I can now send those instrument tracks to those appropriate subs. Sub bass, all the guitars, select them all, route them all to sub guitar, and then the last one here is V piano to V inst. And finally, all three of our new subs can route to comp. You starting to see the flow here? Everything flows into its sub, and the subs all come to comp. Comp here splits out to, again, the three different master faders, or the print channel, if we choose to, when we're done mixing. Finally, we're at the Mount Olympus of my mix, <laughs> the synthesizer and piano tracks. This can be done in a number of ways. So I'll first show the obnoxious setup I use in my All the Synths template and then back off to the songwriter quickie config I use for quick idea sketches. All right, here we are going to create a stereo audio track. I'm gonna call it C7. Then I'm gonna create a stereo audio track called uh, Modular. I'll, I'll discuss what these are later. Then I'm gonna make 12 <laughs> stereo audio tracks called Synths. Then I have to add one mono called DX7 because that's a mono synth. Although I guess it, I could put it into an effect or something and make it stereo. And then finally I will have three stereo aux for subs. All right, are you ready? Watch this. <laughs> Pretty obnoxious, isn't it? Don't panic. I won't make you sit here watching me type in all the names. Again, referring to my hardware mixer layout, the piano has a stereo pair of mics, and they are the first after the voiceover audio ends. Next is modular, which also is a stereo input, followed by my obnoxious synth collection here of 12 stereo inputs and one mono input for the old ass DX7. Now there's even more gear in the studio, like a Blofeld and an MC707, a couple of other modular cases and so on, but you get the idea. Coloring is very important to me, so let's color the modular a dull pink. And the piano is a red-like Vox because it is an open microphone config. I need to continually be careful not to blow my ears out with feedback and such. And the synths are all a nice calming purple. The usual splash of blue over here on the subs, and coloring is done. Now for the buses. Modular gets its own sub because as I mentioned, there may be a couple of racks coming in. Plus I want modular, which is usually a gigantic wall of sound, to be isolated from all the other instruments in the mix. So we'll assign this its own sub. The piano also gets its own sub, despite the default being only two mics, but that could change depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. Like maybe adding a bottom or top mic or room mics, send and return effects to gears, etc. I want to keep the piano isolated as well. Sub C7. And finally, at least for the initial stages of sketching, all the synths in the room can sum to a single sub for now. The AUGS subs get colored blue, like usual, get their inputs assigned accordingly. And then all three, of course, outputs go to comp.
Oh, hold on, I forgot to shut off my phone. My phone's blowing up. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Whoa. Donald Trump was just shot. All right, uh, I need to go figure out what that's all about, so we'll get back to this in a, in a moment. Okay, I'm back. It's been a crazy week, and I'm not sure that I will leave that interruption in the final video, but maybe I should. It was quite a significant event for the American people on either side of this love-hate relationship. My opinion? I'm not a fan. But murder is not cool, under any circumstance. But anyway, moving on. For the sake of speeding this up a little bit, I will continue this by just using the template session and bringing in the channels as I cover them next. When these sessions start getting enormous like this, and clearly I am not going to use every single track every single time, I do like creating folders to collapse things out of the way. This is why my AUGS subs are all clustered at the ends here, because I always want those poking out even when the audio tracks are folded up and out of my way. Two examples in this template are the virtual instruments and the band folder. Let me update a little bit of what we just talked about before our <laughs> brief interruption. How the real template is, is I have a Kronos audio and a QS6 audio, even though it's not necessarily the QS6, it could be anything. But for the work I was doing when this template was created, I was using mostly the Elisis QS6, which is my old keyboard from the 90s. And you'll see here there's a note that I'm using my classic JC sounds because I was redoing some of my old songs in modern you know, Pro Tools, but I still wanted to use some of the instruments and some of the patches from Elisis sound sets. So there are two stereo audio tracks here, the QS6 and the Kronos, plus there are these 16 audio tracks here from the Integra 7. Usually the Kronos is my main controller sitting on a stand and above it my trusty Elisis QS6.1, although that keyboard is usually swapped out for something else, like now perhaps the UBXA. And before these key subs, though, I wanted to add a basic folder called the band and the 16 audio channels for the Integra called Integra 1 through 16 that I'll briefly explain now. Notice those 16 Integra tracks are inside of a basic folder so I can collapse them out of the way. I think other DAWs have this folder concept like Logic, I think calls them track stacks. This way, if I'm not using the Integra specifically for this sketch session, he's not sucking up all my real estate. These Integra tracks are here to act as an alternative to the virtual instrument band that I set up to the left here. I might have the Integra play a bass line, maybe a couple of acoustic guitars, electronic guitars, sitars, literally anything in the 6,000 programs built into this amazing Roland Integra 7 tone generator. Integra 10 is if I want to use any Roland V-Drum kits, and so on. So let's collapse this folder out of the way for now. Speaking of drum kits, there are again a couple of ways I can set up a drum kit in my session, like eight mono audio mic inputs for a live kit. Or for this example, I'll use my trusty Burt in a Box Easy Drummer Virtual Instrument. What you see here is the Easy Drummer folder, which collapses all of the Easy Drummer related tracks. And that includes this Easy Drummer Virtual Instrument right here. Get that out of the way and then a uh, seven channels for all the drums that come out of Easy Drummer. And those are all mapped through this mixer here in Easy Drummer. You can see the kicks all come out track one, the snares out track two and three, and then hats, toms, overheads, and room mics are all four through seven. So that's what, that's what we have set up right here. So to hear what this guy sounds like, I will arm the inputs of all of these and let's go to a groove and let's just play something. Let's do a 16th tight open. And this is of course related to just this VST and how it's designed. You can see I have my kick drum here, I got my snares here, you can see the hi-hats and the overheads and everybody all coming in, all these other channels. So it's pretty neat. Just the kick. Just the snares. Just 
just the hi-hats and so forth. It's kind of neat. So anyway, and then of course all of those audio tracks come to a sub right here. So let me fold that out of the way real quick and show the last bit over here. And this is this is another folder that I usually add to my to my sketch pad. And this is just general MIDI tracks here again: kick, snare, hats, toms, and cymbals for anything. I can I can actually use this to program Easy Drummer. It depends on where you aim the channel, or I can aim it at Integra if I want to use the Roland V drums in here. So that's kind of what this channel here is for, is for recording the Integra. If I don't, well, I got multiple ways of doing things because I just didn't want to set up everything every single time. So I could also use my Integra 10 channel over there, or I can use this V drums audio to record the entire drum kit. Either way works. And, uh, and I like having options like this, so I'm not fumble farting around when I'm trying to be creative. And of course, whatever audio comes out of the V drums then goes to a V drum sub and everybody goes to comp. That's just kind of how everything works in my world and ending up in comp. Anyway, into the home stretch. For session effects, I have a couple of different types of presets I can use for instant recall. For this template, I'll just use my good old FX rack preset that I designed ages ago. So what do we have here? We have four reverbs two delays, and two other miscellaneous effects preset to flanger and chorus that I use most often, but they could be anything. Once again, you can see all the buses are set up like usual, sub FX out to the sub FX in, and then of course the sub FX sub goes to comp. Again, everything goes to comp. Now the more unusual thing for all these effects channels is every one of these has its own bus input. So it winds up eating up a lot of buses in the session for every single channel. So I have eight effects channels and that means all eight need their own input bus. How I use these effects tracks is from whatever audio track I want to have some delay on, I'll just use a send from that channel to the D Echo Boy bus in this example and set the amount of signal I want to go there and I have ultimate control this way. Now if I snap that snare, you can hear it having an echo effect. Right now I have the send on a sub, so that means the entire kit will go there and echo all over the place. So you get the idea. For most of the years before I got into Pro Tools, I used to do FX chains. So that would be like the the reverb would be here and the delay would be here and the uh, you know some kind of compression would be here or whatever. I, so I wound up stacking a bunch of things in a chain and I guess that's still okay to do. I don't choose to work that way anymore because again, I want every single one of my sends to have an exact amount of control over how much signal goes there. So I lay them out this way versus vertically, if that makes sense. The last thing that's in my Songwriter Quickie template are two more MIDI tracks aimed at the Kronos and QS 6.1 or whatever I have staged above Kronos. This is, again, just for tapping out some ideas in MIDI should I need to, otherwise they are completely optional. With that, let's review this Songwriter Quickie template again and see what we got. Left to right, here's what we have. We have three master faders going to my three outputs in the studio, a final print track, a comp track with a limiter plugin and VU meter for monitoring levels before and after limiter. I have a vocal track and a sub right here, which can have multiple vocals if I choose to. I have a virtual instrument folder with all of its virtual instruments inside and I can collapse this folder to get it out of the way and still have access to the submixes so I can add additional processing on these sub channels. I then have my usual two synthesizer tracks and my C7 piano, stereo mics, and of course the modular all coming in as well. And they go to a sub keys, which is all the way the heck down here. And then in the middle, I have what I call the band, which is the Integra 16 channel 
multi-timbral sound module that's just pretty freaking amazing to work with. I kind of love it. That subs up also to the key subs. The piano gets routed to its own sub for, for individual processing. And then, of course, we have modular that also goes to its own sub in case I need to shave off some of the lows or add compression or limiting or whatever that comes out of the modular. Right. And then next, of course, we have the Easy Drummer that you hear playing this little tune right now. And every one of these drums is mic'd individually into its own audio track for individual processing and mixing should I choose to use Easy Drummer. If I don't use Easy Drummer, I could also use MIDI drums to the Integra or some other external drum device. Or the thing I didn't show in this session was building the actual audio microphone, miking a drum set with you know eight to 10 microphones which is also an option. And again, I would probably bury that under a folder. And finally, the FX rack, which again is just one way of doing it. When I get to the templates walkthrough, I'll show you different ways of setting up my audio effects and subs that have been working for me for nearly 15 years. For one last look, here's the edit view with all the tracks laid out as well, which is where I am for most of my tracking phase. Under the virtual instruments, I have a acoustic guitar playing right now and I made this little bass riff here using this expand full-fingered bass instrument and of course down here under Easy Drummer I just found uh, again a preset hi-hat kick snare thing that's just looping indefinitely right now for my little outro song and uh, believe it or not this is one of my smaller templates so I guess that's it for this walkthrough of how I build a full session from a blank page if you found anything useful here or would like to see me create more content like this tap that like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this coming up soon. Thank you for watching and take care everyone.